So, Paul, I wanted to talk to you about something very interesting to me, uh, a body of research. Have you ever heard of John B. Calhoun or uh, the behavioral sink? John Calhoun. I mean, it sounds like a Civil War general, or was he? Uh, maybe, but the one I'm talking about is an ethologist uh, and behavioral scientist best known for his study uh, on rat populations, dating way back to the latter half of last century. No, that doesn't ring a bell. He worked, uh, taught at many universities, um, also John Hopkins and Walter Reed, but much of his work was done for NIM, the National Institute of Mental Health. NIM. I'm vaguely remembering a movie, like The Secrets of Nim. That was that. Yes, movie? I believe it was. Uh, I would say inspired around his notoriety, um, in the sense that the research on rats at Nim were so identifiable during that time. But I don't believe it was based on his actual specific research. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it was a cartoon actually. Yeah. Anyway, among his work there was a set of experiments called Rat Universes. Uh, of which he created many. These universes were spaces that had no shortage of food, water, or bedding, and there were no predators. The only limit was space. So they had everything in the quantities they would need as their colony grew, except space. Okay. He would start by introducing several males and several females to this space, this universe. And he, uh, along with his researchers, would track everything, uh, consumption, uh, mating, behaviors like uh, grooming, uh, fighting, li literally everything. So, and forgive me for not having the precise numbers, but as the experiments would unfold, at first, uh, things would go quite well. The population would double at a good clip, and the social behaviors were, were normal okay, for rats. But it couldn't keep doubling because the space was limited? Well, no, but the population growth started declining well before the amount of normal living space for the population was approached. So, for example, in his most robust universe, the population peaked to about 2,000 mice, but there was adequate space for a population twice that size. Oh, wow. So in these experiments, the only limitation, the physical dimension of the universe, never became an actual problem the rats had to deal with. So why did the uh, population decline? Good question. As the population neared its peak, new behaviors began to reveal themselves. There was a breakdown in social structure. Uh, females would abandon their young before weaning or, or simply entirely. Yikes. Sometimes the females would attack their young. Non-dominant males rejected social interactions. There was a marked increase of pansexuality. And, and then there was this group that John dubbed the beautiful ones that rejected all social interactions and just stayed to themselves. They didn't attempt to mate, and they just groomed themselves all day. Hence, the beautiful ones. This is fascinating. Yeah, it is. It, what's most interesting is that these effects were permanent. So even as the population declined to, say, 100 where every mouse could have a mansion in terms of space, the effects continued. Even when there were 20 mice. Really? There were many of these universes made, and every single one ended the same way. That is scary. So, so, so overcrowding caused their society irreparable damage? Well, look, many people used his research at the time to express fear in overcrowding because that's what it appeared to show. But John recognized this as a disconnect, that that is not quite what it showed. And he later lamented that he couldn't get the correct message across about his research. And what was that? Well, from what I've read, some being John's fleeting comments and notes, it appears that, and especially because his universe has never reached true crowdedness, I believe his comments on social roles are most relevant. Okay, is this like a Dunbar's number where you have... No, 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 not really, no. Dunbar's number is largely irrelevant for 99.9% .9 of the population, right? It essentially just describes an individual's limit uh, of stable participation. You know, um, 
there's some problems around that and that it was extrapolated from primates whose social construction was, I mean, at least it could be, which to me is obvious, uh, limited by natural occurrence. Natural occurrence of resources, the... habitat, food. Okay. Calhoun's research pointed to a much smaller number, something around 12 maybe, that represented important social roles. So think mother, father, grandmother, best friend, and so on. Okay. So it wasn't crowdedness. His rat universes used increasing crowdedness to bring into existence more frequent social contact. Calhoun postulated that it was likely just the increased social contact. And remember, they had no predators, right? No shortage of resources. And they never even got close to not having enough space. Okay, that makes sense. So it wasn't the physical overcrowding. Correct. And in my estimation, and I believe Calhoun's too, uh, that overabundance of social roles degrades the value of all social roles. What does that mean exactly? Okay, well, so let's say this was 200 years ago. And you lived on a farm with your family. And, you know, you go to school a few days a week. Well, your mom and your dad and your siblings, uh, a teacher and a pastor, maybe a few friends, all of them are, let's say, 100 power in your world. Let's say your world, the majority of your world, is 12 people. Okay. Now, let's say today, you not only have, and this is important, uh, maintain contact with friends from preschool, kindergarten, grade school, high school, college. It's in addition to baseball teams, football, tennis, and all that. And all your friends, all their siblings and their parents. In this environment, you can imagine instead of everyone being 100 power in your world, everyone's now maybe 70 power in your world. Okay, but your parents are still 100, no? Maybe not. Maybe because of your exposure to so many people, your parent, who's a good parent, right? And maybe they should be 100 power, but you've seen only the best parts of many other people's parents, right? And even though you might feel guilty, you begin to think your parent, who's actually great, could be better. But that could just be an illusion, kind of like Instagram. Right. Now, this is where I extend Calhoun's research. So far, we've talked about physical population density. And I don't know, do you know uh, Simon Sinek? Uh, yeah, that name sounds familiar, but I can't bring him to mind right now. Well, he's a cultural anthropologist and has some great insight on the effects of social media, especially on our young. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've seen some of his videos. Well, I believe some of his observations weigh on Calhoun's research. If you look at Calhoun and Sinek hard enough, I think a new idea can be extrapolated. Now, I'm not claiming I'm the first to see this, though I'm not aware of anything having been pointed out. But look, we're all familiar with population, right? It's a number. But does your mobile phone or social media use alter this number? Oh, of course. Right. So I have postulated that perhaps there's such a thing as effective population. So, you know, like in taxes, you have a tax rate, right? Which is much like a population number. It's a known known. But when you finally get through all your taxes, deductions, dependents, uh, qualifications, you know, all that stuff, you have a different number, right? You have an effective tax rate. Oh, yeah, I totally see what you're saying. The, the population in America might be 300 million, but social media and mobile phones might make it effectively twice that or more. Exactly. So we might be approaching quote-unquote critical density, an overabundance of social roles, even in the absence of the normally causative physical overpopulation. Oh, yeah. That is definitely what is happening. One of the things that bolsters this idea is the fact that since Facebook opened access to their platform to the public, uh, since that point in time, like 2007... The year after that, teen suicide went from a decline to an incline. And since then, it has doubled. Doubled? Doubled. So you have all children viewing false versions of others, 
vivifying false social role models, right? The one picture they chose out of the hundred they took with the best angles and the best lighting, then that picture is altered to look even better. Yeah. Then you add celebrities into the mix, showing off their lifestyle and their luck. And their luck is often disguised as talent, right? When you compare yourself to all that, it's not good. No, it's not. You know, not to change the subject, but I can't believe in 2020 actors, these people to everything is given, right? Much more than they've earned physically, that they still have the nerve, the gall, to have award shows. Like, what is that? Trophies? And it's not even once a year. They're giving themselves trophies multiple times a year. Yeah, what we reward is sick. It doesn't even make sense. Yeah. But I didn't want to derail your thoughts there, sorry. Well, okay. But I mean, just to add to that, you know, I mean, your Hollywood, it's now more like a cult, right? I mean, there is a reason why everyone in Hollywood has a lockstep narrative, right? Cults have a lockstep narrative. I mean, I mean, look, they'll punish other states for not seeing things the way they want to see it. So it's not difficult to think they don't punish their own ranks for not lockstepping their narrative. Uh, no, not at all, especially when you frame it that way. Well, and, and look, I'm going to be controversial now, if that's okay. We're adults here, Paul. You know, the way I see it is we cannot afford to leave stones unturned, right? And, and just like in nature... Some stones are located in dangerous places, you know, like on a ledge. But we still have to go get them and turn them over, see what's there. Hey, I like that. That's a good way to look at it. Okay, controversy ahead. Okay. Okay, let's look back at the effects on the population near the peak and into the decline. You had females being essentially anti-offspring, right? So, of course, rats don't have birth control, But when they'd have offspring, they'd abandon them or even attack them. Females became very aggressive, right? Much more aggressive than normal. Now, in our society today, we see this lurch away from the exaltation of family and towards the exaltation of just a job, right? And we see a very aggressive feminist branch. I would agree with that. It definitely feels like the importance of family has decreased. You know, jobs have taken a higher status. And and I don't get it. Somehow selling insurance is more important than family. Right. And now let's look at a big portion of males who have essentially removed themselves from society. Oh, like MGTOW. Yeah, and Hikikomori. And we see today, whereas in the past it was for a reason, right? Like towards something, like religion. We see today many young people, especially males, just rejecting being involved with society. Yeah, that's a thing. Now, in rat universes, there was a marked increase in pansexuality. And today, we can see an increase in, well, at the very least, gender dysphoria. Now, without analyzing how much of that is real versus generated, we at least have to see this as having increased, right? Pansexuality, especially on the female side, is approaching topical mainstream. Okay. And I want to reiterate, I am being controversial, right? I am not getting into the details of right or wrong or real or fake. I'm just observing the prevalence in society. You know, I hope that's understood. You know, we're adults, right? We're having adult conversations. Yeah. And, And that's important, right? I mean, if we're unable to have adult conversations, well... I mean, perhaps that is how the beautiful ones begin, right? You know, just turning away. Yeah, some do take it as war, though. You know, they're they're hurt by any notion, however slight, even in exploration. It has to hurt if it's to heal. <laughs> to the winch, wench. What? <laughs> Never mind. No, this is fascinating. I have no doubt that human beings or any other social animal, like rats for that matter, cannot adequately consume an ever-increasing amount of social contacts. Well said, Paul. And and to be more specific, to um, consume, right? Look, we consume things to become better, right? We eat to get energy. We read to get knowledge. 
social contact is something we consume. And, and as we know, if we eat too much or eat junk, we become ill, right? If we read too much, we risk losing perspective. You can read too much. Well, sure, of course. I, reading, after all, is a deep social contact. It's a good point. I never looked at reading like that. It's probably one of the deepest social contacts of someone you don't know. A- and that's why we tend to overweight books or reading in general. See, reading enlists you as an accomplice to the writer's agenda. It asks you to participate in the act of creation by filling in the gaps with your own imagination. So a book, especially a well-written book, becomes partly your own creation, a puzzle you help create and solve. Oh, yeah. I can see that. So, so that's why people are usually more fiercely defensive about the books they've read as opposed to TV or movies they've seen. Right, because they're partially defending themselves. Oh, man. That makes so much sense. Yeah, and they're more susceptible to adopt the writer's points as their own or take the writer's findings as truth without question. And that can be dangerous. Essentially, we're using too many words, right? I think it was said best, everything you add to the truth subtracts from the truth. Who said that? I believe it was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I'll be back. Let some steam off, Bennett. Oh, well, look at that. I know more of his quotes than you. <laughs> the doctor didn't know I was so adroit. <laughs> <laughs>